In the groom mess hall, I heard words like Lorentz forces, pulse detonation, cyclotron radiation, quantum flux, transduction field generators, well, that's a mouthful, quasi-crystal energy lens, and EPR quantum receivers. I was told by both Gerald and a couple of people I talked to at groom that quasi-crystals were the key to a whole new field of propulsion and communications technology. To this day, I'd be hard-pressed to explain to you the unique electrical, optical, and physical properties of quasi-crystals and why so much of the research is classified. Even the unclassified research is funded by agencies like the Department of Energy and Department of Defense. Why is the U.S. Department of Energy and Ames Laboratory so vigorously pursuing research in quasi-crystals? A quote from the DOE. Our goal is to understand and facilitate exploitation of special properties of quasi-crystals. These properties include, but are not limited to, low thermal and electrical con conductivity, high hardness, low friction, and good oxidation resistance. That's the unclassified part. What are quasi-crystals? In 1984, a paper was published which marked the discovery of quasi-crystals. Two distinctly different metallic crystals joined symmetrically together. By 1986, several top-secret advanced studies were going on funded by DARPA, with leading scientists already working in the field. In classical crystallography, a crystal is defined as a three-dimensional periodic arrangement of atoms with transitional periodicity along its principal axes. Since, quasi <coughs> excuse me. Since quasi crystals lose their periodicity in at least one dimension, it is not possible to describe them in three-dimensional space as easily as normal crystal structures. This is because this becomes more difficult to find mathematical formulas for interpretation and analysis of the diffraction data. After the discovery of quasi-crystals in 1984, a close rem resemblance was noted between icosahedral quasi-crystals and 3D Penrose tiling. Penrose tiling is basically is nothing more than if you saw a tile floor that had two, uh, two different tiles, one say has five sides and one has seven sides, that match up and repeat continually. But once you get into a three-dimensional Penrose tiling, uh, then you just, if you can, you have to imagine these things repeating in three different dimensions. The British mathematician Ron, Roger Penrose devised a way to cover a plane in a non-periodic fashion using two different types of tiles. A simple example of 3D tiling can be seen on this slide. The tiles are arranged in a way that they obey certain matching rules. This is called 3D Penrose tiling, which, makes, which is made up of rhombohedron. A dozen years later, Penrose tiling became the prototype of very powerful models to explain the structures of quasi-crystals discovered 14... <coughs> to explain the quasi-crystals discovered. Fourteen years of quasi-crystal research has established the existence <coughs> of a wealth of st stable and metastable quasi-crystals with five, eight, ten, and twelve-fold symmetry, with strange structures and interesting properties. New tools had to be developed for the study and description of these extraordinary materials. I've discovered that classified research has shown that quasi-crystals are used for high energy storage materials, metal matrix components, thermal barriers, exotic coatings, infrared sensors, high power laser applications, and electromagnetics. S some high strength alloys and surgical tools are already on the market using quasi crystals. The reason I've presented this in detail is since I barely mentioned quasi crystals last year. Um, I've been asked by so many hundreds of people to say, well, explain what quasi crystals are. So most of what I explain is over my head, too. So <laughs> thank you for staying awake during that. One of the stories I heard <clears throat> or was told more than once was that quasi crystal pairs were used in the propulsion of the Roswell crash. The fact that these crystals, millions of tiny, 
quasicrystals. Remember, quasicrystals are two separately shaped three-dimensional crystals joined together symmetrically. These millions of crystals coated the bottom of this UFO. And that one of these crystals was made of hydrogen. Until recently, creating a hydrogen crystal was beyond the reach of our scientific capabilities. That's changed. I don't have a lot of details about what's going on with the hydrogen crystals, but I suspect I will soon. While I groom, I wrote down everything I saw, heard, and touched in my log every night before going to bed. I've always been a journaler. By the way, the food at the groom mess hall was probably as good as any four-star restaurant. But what would you expect? There was no cable, no women, and no alcohol. So they had to do something right. Later, while back at the base, my routine went on as normal as did my part-time job that summer as running security for the Silver Dollar Saloon. My NSA friend, Gerald, who managed a team who investigated and watched those with highly classified jobs at the Nevada Test Site, Nellis Range, and many other classified facilities, showed up one night. He was checking up on a guy who had a drinking problem who worked at the Nevada Test Site. That's where they set off the underground atomic explosions. He happened to mention a vehicle that could be boosted into orbit and return and land in the Nevada desert. This was in the late 70s. It was an unmanned reconnaissance vehicle which took off from a B-52 bomber and used booster rockets to place it in term temporary low Earth orbit. I thought he was feeding me a line of bull. Oop, too soon. Let me see. Right there. This vehicle is remotely piloted and communications are made via the docile system at Groom, he told me. I'm not usually too slow, but it didn't hit me until he said, you know, direct orbital communications link. Then it hit me. It was the unit that I had taken apart while I was troubleshooting this multi-bay system, the one that had the large integrated circuit chip on it. These are some old pictures of the virtual reality lab at Brooks Air Force Base, where the software to remotely pie, <clears throat> remotely five exotic vehicles was developed. Let me get back to the development of Alien Rapture now. After I agreed to write my co-conspirator's story, I like the sound of that, it's kind of like Tom Clancy is or something, I talked to several military judge advocate general lawyers, or JAG lawyers, as some of you may be familiar with. I told these lawyers I wanted to write about my experiences in the military and been on many classified programs. I was told that I had to write my story as fiction, which I have, I was told that I couldn't name any real individuals with clearances or covers or their working names, which I haven't. I was also told that I couldn't discuss any secrets of these programs I had been personally assigned to, which I have not done. Then I was told as long as I did that, I could pretty much write, write what I damn well wanted to. Of course, I didn't tell them that I was going to be interviewing pilots and engineers and technicians that had worked black programs, had flown black aircraft, or that I was going to write about UFO contact or reverse engineering of alien technology. It slipped my mind. I just, uh... <laughs> you know how it is, you tell the government too much and they just get confused, so. <laughs> in the summer of 1992, we met again in Las Vegas. The five friends and I. I had compiled my notes from our first meetings, the interviews from several people that had already, already taken place, and other input I'd received. Each of my friends had reached out to their own personal contacts, which uncovered a wealth of information. We agreed I was the only one who could write the story and get away with it, since I was planning on getting out of the DOD. My friends were all married and still part of the Defense Department. And I was single and had planned on getting out. I just, uh, it was time. <clears throat> Bud, one of my co-conspirators and close friends, had informed me that he had a cancerous tumor and was severely depressed 
and was seeing a neurologist. Uh, they told him the t brain tumor was un unoperable, and uh, 30 days later, he passed from this earth. It was a real blow to the rest of us. We had lost Gerald the year before from a heart attack. Of the remaining three friends, Sal has dropped from the face of the earth, and not one of my contacts has been able to locate him for two years. He was extremely paranoid about two deaths, which I, I wasn't. I thought they were just normal things that happened. And had, he had had second thoughts about the book. He said he was going to travel and didn't know when he was going to contact me next. I uh, like to think maybe he's on a Pacific island drinking Mai Tais or something. Let me talk about my friend Doc. He has a theory that UFOs seem to like fast aircraft. The SR-71 pilot, who I knew him well, Doc, was stationed at Kadena Air Force Base, where the SR-75s were located on the Sac side in 1973. While flying back from the, across the South China Sea from a reconnaissance mission, the SR-71 pilot encountered a shadow over his cockpit. Doc said his avionic systems went totally haywire. And he felt the aircraft nose down slightly, which can be dangerous at 2,000 miles per hour, or 35 miles per minute. When he looked up, he was so startled that he almost panicked. And he immediately made invasive maneuvers to the right and down, which is one of the many maneuvers they can make when they uh, have a missile lock on, for example. But the maneuvering is subtle because at that speed, uh, you can't make radical maneuvers. Doc said the object was so big that it totally blocked out the sun. His estimate was that it was 250 to 300 feet across. It was oval in shape and appeared to be bright blue-gray in color. But he wasn't sure as the shimmering of high-energy halo that surrounded it made it hard to determine the actual shape. About three minutes later and some thousands of feet lower, the vehicle reappeared on his left wingtip. He tried his UHF and VHF radio and all he could pick up was a deep electrical hum. He abandoned his attempts to use his radio as his immediate survival was more important to him at the moment. For the next 10 minutes, the large oval vehicle moved around the left wing tip at the rear of the aircraft and then to the right wing tip. Doc said he got a sound in his head, and I quote Doc, like a swarm of bees in my brain, as he described it. The movement from left to the rear to the right wing tip took about two minutes, and then it reversed its movement. On the UFO's last wing to the rear of the SR-71, his aircraft started buffeting wildly, which is terrifying at Mach 3. Then it stopped after about 15 seconds, and he never saw it again. When Doc returned from his mission, he immediately went to his debriefing. The minute he mentioned the incident with the unidentified object, his commander pulled him away from the debriefing and was taken to his commander's office. After he filled out an incident report in detail, he was told not to mention the incident to anyone, or he'd be subject to a severe penalty under UCMJ. Doc told me they didn't know one SR-71 pilot or astronaut who had not had a close encounter with a UFO or a sighting. He felt that not one of them would ever go on record with their experiences because of fear of retaliation from the Department of Defense or the loss of their retirement pay and benefits for breaking the secrets acts. During the nine years after this in-flight incident, Doc related that a few of his trusted friends related similar incidents to him with same types of vehicles or glowing orbs dancing around their aircraft during flight. Then Doc told me another story about his friend Dave. Dave was also an SR-71 Blackbird pilot. While drunk on sake in Japan, Dave told him in whispers, whispers that he didn't used to drink until he made a reconnaissance flight over the eastern border of Russia six months before. When Dave returned from this flight, he was delirious and semi-conscious. His crew had to pull him out of the aircraft. The flight surgeon attributed his symptoms to loss of oxygen. Dave didn't share his nightmares with the Air Force doctors for fear that the flight surgeon would ground him and he would lose his flying status. Anybody that's ever known a pilot, especially an Air Force or a Navy pilot, they will give up a kid, a left leg, a lung, just about anything to keep their flight status. So they just didn't tell flight surgeons when they had problems. But under the influence of alcohol, in a quiet bar with a close trusted friend, Dave opened up. He carefully related an emotional story that he had had nightmares every night. 
that something he was sure had gotten to him during his flight over Russia. What made matters worse for him was he had absolutely no memory of the flight. 